Hello everyone, I'm your host Nicole Wood and welcome to SciCom Monday. Uh, for those of you who are new to SciCom Monday, uh, we try to make this as engaging a format as possible. So uh, please feel free to send in your questions uh, during the broadcast and we'll uh, answer them um, as fast as we can. If we aren't able to get to all of your questions today, feel free to tweet myself, uh, the broadcast, and also our guest um, after the show. And then also if you're watching on replay later, definitely please engage with us on Twitter. So today's guest is uh, Carly uh, Robiar. She's uh, had the pleasure of being educated actually in SciComm. So this is our first person that we're having on that is uh, truly got that background in a SciComm education rather than just uh, scientists who are playing around in SciComm. So we're really excited to have her on. So with that, uh, Carly, uh, welcome to SciComm Monday. Thanks for having me. That's fantastic. Yeah, I guess I'm like the first person with formal training in science communication. Yeah, yeah I mean, definitely. And I, I think that's going to be a really good thing for everyone to get to hear about because I, I consider myself a scientist first and a communicator second. So to actually be able to talk to someone who had that formalized training, I think is going to be really good. So I'm definitely going to be picking your ear through the uh, whole broadcast. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background so everyone kind of knows where you're coming from? Yeah, of course. Um, I would say that uh, science interest probably came first because I've been a huge animal fan since I was a little kid. Um, whether or not I came by that myself or because my mom is also a big fan of animals, I'm not sure, but it certainly helped. Um, but I was always that kid that had a ton of uh, encyclopedias about animals and was always talking about these animals that nobody in my family had ever heard of. And they're like, where did you, where are you? how do you know this? I don't know, nature shows, they're great. Um, and so I went into biology uh, for my undergraduate degree, and I also have a, a second major in psychology as well. Um, but as I got further and further into my education, I also noticed I really liked entertaining, and I really liked comedy, I really liked being on stage in theater. Um, so I've also done a lot of that, in, through high school and in university. I've had a couple of opportunities as well. And so when I started going to university, came time to look for a summer job. And I applied to a lot of different biology positions like pet stores, um, you know, summer student positions for uh, tech, uh, tech, like uh, wildlife technicians. And then my friend was like, you should go apply to one of the provincial parks nearby because they um, need bi people who are interested in biology, but also you get to dress up as animals over the weekend and, you know, go on stage and do a little show for the kids. I'm like, that's a job? Oh, my God. So uh, that started my career in heritage communicating and wildlife communicating and wildlife interpreting. So I describe myself as an interpreter. A lot of people think that means that I speak a lot of different languages, um, but I'm not a linguistic interpreter. I'm a wildlife interpreter. So that means that when people get out there into nature, they don't really know they don't really know what they're looking at the same way that someone who walks into a new culture or a new language doesn't necessarily know how to interact with it. So I am that interpreter for the outdoors, for wildlife, uh, for the plants and animals in the area to be able to say, you know, this is the, these, this is why this is important. Here's what this plant is called. Did you know? Did you know that it does a cool thing? Um, and that's uh, mostly my was at. But then, of course, I found out about the science communication program after my undergraduate degree. Um, and I thought that was the perfect way to continue pursuing my career as an interpreter. A really great way to add uh, add to that career path. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think it's always interesting to hear uh, people's backgrounds and how they kind of get into SciComm. And um, I like the fact that you're so interested in theater and other things, because I think that helps you as you're actively talking to people. Because I, I know that's one of the things that I see that's lacking a lot in science, you know, as far as, you know, a scientist's background is that ability to actually speak and engage with people. We can, we can talk about science, but talking to people to the point where they can actually understand and gauge what it is that we're saying, I think sometimes it's lacking. So 
I, I think that's a really good quality that you have. So, yeah, that's one of the that's one of the reasons why I, I chose to focus specifically on this career path was because during university I got the impression more and more that other people who were training in the sciences like me didn't necessarily end up having those communication skills that I loved to have. So I was like, okay, I can be the I can be those two things for people. Let's do that. Right. Yeah. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about the program at uh, yep. Laurentian University? Because as far as I know. That's the only program that I've heard of where it actually is an actual formal education in science communication. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about the program there? Yeah, sure. It's, it is definitely the only program of its kind in Canada. Um, and it is a, what I have is a graduate diploma in science communication. So it's a one year program. In my case, it was 10 months specifically. And you have to prove, first of all, in order to apply, that you already have a certain level of understanding of scientific topics. And the usual grad school requirement of a 70% or higher for your GPA from, from undergrad, um, because it is a graduate program. So you don't necessarily even have to have specifically an honors bachelor of science. Um, some of our uh, graduates ha have other bachelors that aren't science bachelors, but they had that interest, they have that background, like they had a, say they volunteered for an environmental organization a lot and got that sort of background info, um, or they worked at a job where, where that's required. Um, so that's the main thing you need to get in. Once you're in, it starts in the fall and you go through a number of different courses that focus on making you that mediator between scientists and the general public. So while it is a great thing for, for scientists who want to continue on with a PhD to do, because heck yeah, I'd spend a year just adding that extra little bit, um, overall the, the program itself is catered to people who, who want to be a science communicator specifically. But there's lots of different ways that you can use that. So they have courses like Audiences and Issues. That's a course that I took. The title of the course is Audience and Issues, focusing on here are some of the things that science communicators are up against these days. So we talked about vaccine um, hesitation, I guess you could say, um, evolution as a communicating concept, um, those sorts of contra politically controversial issues, because, of course, you know, it's nice to try and say science isn't political, but then, of course, you kind of have to get there sometimes in order to communicate it properly. Um, we took design theory. So one of our courses was learning the basics of design, particularly for interfaces, how people interact with certain objects or displays. Um, because that was really helpful for interactive forms of science communication, like exhibits. That was basically the intro to exhibits for us. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting, like those mm -hmm. two courses right there, because I, I, I find that a lot of times scientists, we understand science really easily, but you go just right outside that sphere of you know science influence, and people don't always get sometimes those basic core things. And so to be able to understand what it is you know, the knowledge that they're lacking and where we need to like start them at so that way they can understand things I think is really important. I mean, just a good example, just the other day, I was, there was a, a guy uh, back in the woods, they needed to do some uh, uh, changing of the flow of direction of some water because there's flooding in the town. And I was telling him like, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch of ephemeral pools back here. And the look he gave me was such confusion. And it was just like, okay, I need a to like- A fun of a water? <laughs> right, exactly. And so, to like you know be able to come to like their level of things and where they understand and I mean it's the same thing with me like if I'm talking to someone else in a different field of you know research or a completely different topic I need them to come at my level because I don't necessarily understand you know what they're dealing with and then I think it's really interesting designing those projects so that way they will understand because it's yeah. you it doesn't do us any good if we're designing things just for other scientists to understand like we actually have to figure out how to get that audience to understand. Yeah. So that's really it can, interesting. It can be really surprising when taking this program 
uh, to realize how quickly along the path of becoming a scientist, you lose that layperson frame of mind and get a completely different worldview just from that basic understanding of the sciences compared to someone who didn't take grade 12 biology, for example, because they didn't have to, right? Right. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I think of, you know, maybe something like chemistry. You know, I only had to take a limited amount of chemistry, and so anything beyond that I might not understand, or, you know, whatever other topic it is, you know, math or yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's very quickly for you to start losing, and if you aren't using it constantly, too, I think that's also adds on to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know some of the other uh, classes and coursework in there, there was topics about using uh, new media and using traditional media. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. Uh, and actually, that's those two categories are a little bit different from when I took it. Those are new. Um, when I took the program, there were three specializations you could take in the second semester. Um, in addition to your other courses. So I took uh, mass media and live presentation as my two specializations, because of course I love theater, and I also have always been interested in getting into film. So the mass media was good for the film and journalism aspect, and then the live presentation was basically what I do when I'm working in parks and, and as an interpreter, basically just talking to people and knowing how to present it well. Uh, but the third specialization is exhibits, uh, which I didn't take a specialization in, but it was a lot of fun for those who did. And that one is still a third option, but the new classification between live presentation versus mass media is journalism and film are now traditional media, and there's, new, there's a new focus instead of live presentation on new media. So working with social media and new platforms that didn't exist before when this program started, that's been switched over to focus more on how you get onto those cutting edge digital formats. Yeah, I think that's interesting because that's one of the things that we are talking about with a lot of scientists is you can't just use those traditional formats anymore. There's all this new way to communicate with people. And I, I think it's great to see that that program has adjusted with that new influx of social media. So since we do a lot of social media and talk about social media on Psycom I mean, that's the basis of the name of the show. <laughs> yeah, this is um, a great example of that new right. media that they'll be talking about yeah. in the course. Exactly. So what's kind of your opinions when it comes to using social media for science communication and, you know, having scientists communicate with other people through social media? I'm interested to see, like, since you have that background in it, like, how important do you think it is? Do you think it's something valuable? Like, what, what are your opinions about it? Well, it's definitely valuable because it's becoming more and more the standard way that that the average person is communicating with their friend group and their social group, and increasingly more and more so even their value sets and, you know, their, their political bubbles and things like that. So it while that means also that it's getting harder and harder, to be fair, to get to talk to the kinds of people that don't necessarily think to interact with science communication. It's becoming more and more important to at least try um, to be able to get the word out there, I think. And um, it is something we were continuously trying to catch up with in the program, even before we went back when I was in it, before we had the new media category specifically. Um, we were taking time, giving students in my class the opportunity to run our Twitter feed. And so the social media for the program itself was run by students to get that practice and to sort of get a sense of uh, how Twitter works, how to use it effectively. Because yeah, um, being able to communicate on the platforms that people are using every day is one of the few ways that we're going to be able to you know, encourage everyday interaction with science communication for those that aren't already doing it. Because otherwise, you're left with books and journalism. Um, two things that aren't necessarily as engaged with now as they used to be. Um, I mean, I work in a bookstore and it sounds like, you know, the inter people's interest in books isn't going down too, too much. But um, for the younger and younger audiences, it's not necessarily as popular as it once was. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, 
do you think with the, the newer media that you know social media out there do you think that's gonna give scientists a way to be able to tr talk more directly with audiences and become more engaged there's not necessarily that filter that it's going to go through like you know via um different members of the SciComm community like it are our SciComm you know users say like journalists and other folks kind of worried that they might be possibly losing jobs because there is that direct feed or you know do you think that maybe they're going to like in be encouraging of it because scientists are going to become more fluent in communication I think there's always going to be an important place for science journalists and I think that our need for them hasn't really changed I think there's still um, a deficit in the amount of good science journalists that are out there versus you know what would be nice to have it may be getting more and more difficult to be able to what's the word uh, to have like a steady source of income for them because I know journalism in general is very is changing very much but unfortunately that particular world I can't speak to as much in terms of formal journalism um, but I think that in terms of having a direct line of communication one-on-one, -on -one, absolutely social media is a huge um, benefit to that because, I mean, there were there was always, you know, television programs and spots on the news programs and books. Those aren't new, but at the same time, again, they're just a talking head of the scientists, you know, talking to the general public. So it's really nice to have social media to show the scientists that direct feedback of, hey, but what about this? And also, you know, I don't understand what you're saying with this thing. Can you please explain it? Um, so that part's really fantastic, especially on Twitter, like the way that I've been engaging with Twitter, um, with the kinds of scientists like you where, that I engage with on Twitter. Um, it's really fantastic to, compared to when I was a kid being interested in these things, to be able to just talk to them one-on-one -on -one, say hey expert can you tell me more about this that's very cool right yeah like i always kind of like uh compare it to like if you're watching jane goodall on you know the discovery channel and to be able to like send her a message while she's talking live and to be able to get that feedback i mean how Isn't that amazing fantastic? would that be and yeah. you can do that now with these live yeah. streaming platforms i i know nat geo they're they're constantly doing these live safaris from uh, South Africa, which are so neat because you can actually ask that person that's running that uh, Periscope, or it's usually, um, I think uh, they do on Facebook Live. Um, you can ask a question right then and they'll answer you. And it's like, this is so awesome. It's like TV to the next level. And you yeah. learn so much more, I feel. And, and the, the value isn't even necessarily the amount that you can learn for your personal interest. I think one of the pieces of value that not necessarily everyone realizes is the fact that I think in the general public there's a tendency to think of scientists as disconnected from the general public. I mean that's why we try and encourage science communication right is to try and make sure that that's not entirely the case. So when uh, someone who isn't in educated in science has the ability to talk to somebody who is an expert in their scientific field, I think that's really going to help towards people seeing scientists as people, because I think that's not necessarily as common as it should be, considering, yes, we are people. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I wanted to like make sure like we fit in some of the, uh, the cool things that you guys got to do uh, during your program. And one yeah. of the one of the things I, I thought was really neat is when you guys got to go to uh, CTTV. Oh, yeah. CTTV. Yeah. yeah. I always want to put yeah. like an extra C in there or an extra T in there. Um, yeah. So it's what the Canadian Television Network, you know, one of the, the big ones up there. So yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about that experience and who you got to meet there because I may be slightly jealous of who you got to talk to because you <laughs> talked at a. Uh, uh, conference I was at and he was really amazing so to meet him in person I'm slightly jealous of so. <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely going to the set of Daily Planet and being able to chat a little bit with the two hosts uh, was fantastic um, especially when we got to take photos of ourselves on the set with them that was extra cool um, and we after we watched the process that they went through in order to make a broadcast of Daily Planet, um, 
which was cool on its own because you start to actually understand what the process is like for doing that. Um, we got to actually go and have a personal chat with the two of them, see what it's like, what their background was, how they got into science communication on television, um, got to ask their advice about it. Like, you know, if we want to do what you do, what should we do? Um, and for me especially, that was fantastic. Because again, you know, I, I enjoy being in front of a TV screen if I can, not that that's actually happened, but you know, being in front of people and talking to them about science and why it's so exciting and interesting. Um, being able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who's made it was fantastic. Yeah, and, and that was just part of a field trip that we took. So, yeah, which was great. And I, I love how you guys actually got to see that process in action. And and Dan Riskin, I feel like he's definitely someone who he's a scientist first, who then got into communication. Or at least that's how like he presented himself uh, when he came and talked at the Wildlife Society conference. And it was just it was really great because he had this really strong science background and then got into all right let's you know showcase science to everyone and it's just he seems like he's done a, a fantastic job up there and it, it's like I, I follow him on twitter and it seems like he's always going all around every place you know talking about science to people and it's yeah. it's a really good example of how to properly do science communication so. yeah yeah and that's per that's very common for people to start out with that science background and then to sort of venture into the world of being able to talk to people about it is pretty common and then one of the other uh, excursions that you guys got to take was this lab that was underground. Can you tell us a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, a little bit about it, yes. Um, it was a little bit out of my range just because it's a physics lab, and I have to admit I don't know as much about physics and robotics and mechanics as, as I wish I did. Um, but Snow Lab is an underground, clean physics lab. And when I say clean, that means something very specific. It means that um, the idea of that particular lab and it being underground is that as you're going in, like, what, first of all, you have to go through the mine to get there because, again, it's underground. But then you have to take off all the mining gear that you just put on to be safe underground and put on these bunny suits, like these white bunny suits, after taking a shower, because you have to go take a shower, and then they, like, give you this bunny suit outfit to put on because they cannot have any surface land like any surface world contaminants down there you have to put on different shoes uh so it's all very very controlled for the purpose of, of properly monitoring um while eliminating as many variables as possible to get very exact results because they were actually like they were looking for dark matter down there. They, like, they were getting into some very, very high level, um, big questions in terms of uh, astrophysics. Um, and so, uh, so it was, yeah, like very impressive to be able to go through that whole process to say, wow, you do this every day just to go and check your specs. Like, geez. Um, and it was just fascinating the kind of work that they were doing down there. And to think that it was actually, the cool thing about it was that it's in the same uh, region, like the same town region as our school. We didn't have to go far there to get there. It was just like maybe half an hour out of town or something. So the fact that such fantastic research was being done so close to us was, was really refreshing. Yeah, I, that's great. Like I, I uh... I have to admit, being a, a biologist slash ecologist, like I always think of, you know, science and science communication being more on that wildlife kind of spectrum of things. And so it's good that you guys got exposure to other different sciences as well. Because I think sometimes when you're in your discipline, you kind of forget, oh, there's other sciences out there and we need to learn how to communicate all of them and not just mm -hmm. you know, that one that you're always particularly interested in. That program was good for that. I, I because the people who are taking the program, the science communication program, are coming from all those different backgrounds. We had physicists, we had biologists, we had environmental scientists, all that jazz. Great. Um, mm -hmm. So last thing I'm interested in is you're starting to do, uh, what is it, bird taxonomy? Um, and just like, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that and, you know, the fun that you're having with that? Sure. So right now, because I work as a nature interpreter, 
uh, it's always a seasonal position, pretty much always. So my winters are spent not doing too, too much. I mean, I have a part-time job on top of that, but uh, I was starting to miss just doing biology stuff. So one of the things that I've picked up on over the years in biology and in science communication is that it can be a little bit hard to um, maintain collections in, especially in university uh, museums. So I was just sent a sent an email off to the university being like, hey, do you need me help with like your specimens or anything? Cause I'm bored and miss biology. And they were like, sure. Happened to be someone I know that was running the collections. And she was like, yeah, okay, come on down and help. We have birds that need stuffing. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm doing that for the uh, zoology department at uh, Lakehead University where I am. And basically what they need is for someone to take the donated specimens from, say, FLAP and other organizations that collect birds that were accidentally killed um, with window strikes and things like that, and to put them to good use by making them uh, usable specimens in the museum. So for the labs, like for zoology labs, ornithology labs that need to take measurements to, you know, get like the tarsus length of a pigeon, okay, um, they, they need a physical specimen to do that. And so I've been taking birds that they have in the freezer and turning them into stuffed birds that can go in a drawer. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's been an interesting experience because I hadn't done any taxidermy before. Um, but uh, I, I like the fact that I'm able, like I have permission to show the process on Twitter as I'm doing it, because I think for a lot of people that is sort of a, a gap bridging between, uh, between like the biological process of the process of being a biologist and just not having any understanding of what that world is like. Because where, how do you get the birds in a museum? Well, you do this. It's kind of gross, but that's how it's done. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, it's one of the, like, the big things is uh, there is, um, I think, was it a uh, university down in Louisiana? I can't remember exactly which university it was, but they were saying yep. something that they might end up losing their collection. And I think people forget how important these collections are, because without them, what do we reference when it comes to learning uh, animals? I, I know we took a class that was called Nature Study uh, during my undergrad, where it was all just using those uh, museum specimens to be able to learn our birds and other animals and without them it would have been so difficult to be able to truly learn them because you need to be able to get up close with these animals that's kind of hard to do with live animals that you're chasing around out in the field or if even if you've got your um, binoculars it's still so much easier to learn those animals if you can actually have them in hand and learn them so. yeah and one of my favorites this isn't going to be surprising at all but one of my favorite science communicators is Emily Grassley because she just has done such a fantastic job of advocating for museums and why they do what they do so hopefully I'm helping a little bit with her process by by tweeting the taxidermy that I'm doing <laughs> Yeah, no, I love her. She's great. I, th I think there's rumors that she might be uh, coming to uh, CMU at some point, but we'll see if that uh, actually happens. So hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, we'll get her there. Um, but yeah, with that, um, I'm going to, I think we're running out of time here. So yeah, fair. probably should uh, sign off. So I definitely want to say uh, thank you to Carly for ha uh, coming on. It was great having you. Thank you for having me. This was fantastic. So uh, if you are interested in uh, talking to Carly more, uh, feel free to tweet her at uh, Inconsiderat. Um, uh, and then um, if you're interested in talking to uh, me, uh, tweet me at either SciCom Monday or at my uh, Wildlife BioGal handle. Uh, either one is great. And then for uh, next week, we're going to be uh, a little interesting, should be a little fun, but uh, we're going to be uh, talking, uh, we'll be live from Rutgers University. So I'm traveling to Rutgers. This is going to be a live broadcast, so this should be kind of interesting. So we're going to be doing a uh, fieldwork live session uh, Monday night. 
Uh, not quite 100% sure on the time yet, so stay tuned because it all depends on weather and everything. But we'll be with Kathleen Farley, a uh, cafeterian on Twitter, uh, working with some of her woodcock uh, field work um, in New Jersey. So hopefully the weather holds true for that. And then the next day we'll be broadcasting live from Rutgers University with hopefully a number of different uh, students there so you get a, a good sense of all of their projects that are going on. And then in case everything, you know, weather and everything else doesn't work out, I'll do uh, an Ask Me Anything before I have to get on the plane. So it'll be earlier in the day. It won't be at our usual 4 o'clock broadcast time because I will be on a plane at 4 o'clock flying from Michigan to New Jersey. So we'll probably do that about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, stay tuned for actual times as to uh, when that will happen. So with that, I hope you guys all had a great time. Thank you for uh, joining us. And like I said, if you are watching this on replay, feel free to tweet us afterwards. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Um, go out, explore, do some science, have some fun, and hopefully we'll be seeing you next week.